Okay. Well, uh, thank everybody for uh, attending this uh, monthly webinar. Uh, tonight I wanted to get into some really basic uh, libertarianism, as you can tell by the title, What Social Animals uh, Owe to Each Other. This will also relate, uh, as you might uh, already uh, think, uh, to a debate that's raging among libertarians these days uh, with such uh, strange terms as stick versus thin libertarianism, humanitarian versus uh, brutalist libertarianism. Uh, this has been going on now for a few months. Actually, it goes back further than that, but it uh, it came to light, uh, uh, came back to the forefront uh, after a series of articles uh, written by uh, a number of different people on all sides. So it does relate to that, and then that can come up in the uh, in the discussion uh, part of this. So let me begin. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about ethics and political ethics. And uh, the first thing I think we have to uh, understand is that ethics is not geometry. Uh, we can't expect the same kind of uh, proofs that you find in geometry in uh, in ethics. And uh, my my authority on this, I'll cite. I'll make an argument from authority, although although I think it makes good sense just on the face of it. I'll cite Aristotle from book one of his uh, Nicomachean Ethics, where he wrote, uh, our discussion, this is when he's first introducing the ethics to people, our discussion will be adequate if it has as much clearness as the subject matter admi admits of, for precision is not to be sought for alike uh, in all discussions, any more than in all products uh, of the crafts. We must be content then in speaking of such subjects and with such premises to indicate the truth roughly in roughly and in outline and in speaking about things which are only for the most part true and with premises of the same kind to reach conclusions that are no better in the same spirit therefore should each type of statement be received for it is the mark of an educated man to look for precision in each class of things just so far as the nature of the subject admits it is evidently uh, equally foolish to accept probable reasoning from a mathematician and demand from a rhetorician scientific proofs. So that, with that as groundwork, I now uh, let me launch into the main, uh, the main point here. Now, if I were compelled to summarize the libertarian philosophy, uh, its distinguishing characteristic, its distinguishing feature, while standing on one foot, I might say the following: Every person owes it to all other persons not to aggress against them. Uh, this is known as the non-aggression principle, or the NAP. Uh, Rothbard called it the non-aggression axiom. Gary Chartier calls it the non-aggression maxim. I've made my contribution to this collection of terms by uh, dubbing it now the non-aggression obligation. Now, calling it a non-aggression obligation is, uh, is really just the flip side of saying that uh, people have a right not to be aggressed against. So... Uh, you know, we we use the term right to mean that other people have a corresponding obligation, or else uh, I don't know what it would mean to call something a right. Now, one exception to this was a very early uh, thinker in the modern political philosophy, a person who's credited with launching modern political philosophy, and that's Haas. Thomas Haas used, uh, did not use the word right in that way. For him, a right did not mean that um, uh, other people had a corresponding obligation. It simply meant you were right to try to do something, and someone else could be right to try to do uh, something else, and those two things may well conflict. So uh, Hobbes said that in the state of nature, uh, you know, you had a right to uh, do the best you can to protect your life and to make your life better, and so did I. But if I thought that my, making my life better meant killing you, I had a right to do that. Although you also had a right to protect yourself. So he does, he does not use the, the word right the way Locke and everyone else basically since then. Um, has used it. By the way, that's why Hobbes thought we needed the state, because the, the, the state of nature was such a horrible thing that uh, nothing could be worse, and therefore, you know, giving all power to a, a sovereign uh, was clearly better than living in the state of nature. But this, this is not about Hobbes, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave that there. Anyway, there's the right, the, if there's a right not to be aggressed against, then there's an obligation not to aggress on the part of everyone else. Uh, you know, Rothbard and uh, Roderick Long have, uh, have defined freedom as to mean the freedom not to be aggressed against, the freedom from aggression. Uh, Roderick goes as far as to say there's really only one right, and that is the right not to be aggressed against. From there, you can get property rights and the other things we think of, but those are just applications. There's really only one right. There, and in fact, he argues that there can't be more than one right uh, if, if this other right uh, doesn't itself stem from the right to be 
uh, free from aggression. And this is how Rothbard, uh, by the way, uh, uh, validates his argument that there can be complete freedom, there can be perfect freedom, everybody can be free if you, if you uh, construe freedom as the freedom from aggression. Uh, you know, the freedom from aggression, like my, my owning property, let's say my owning a plot of land and keeping other people off, sometimes that's thought of as a violation of other people's freedom, but Rothbard would say, no, that's only a violation of other people's power. Your powers are limited, but your freedom uh, can be complete and un uh, unlimited. Uh, there's debate in political science about that. Some people want to take a less non-normative uh, notion of freedom and, and say that under, uh, even a libertarian might say that under a, uh, a proper regime of freedom, your freedom is limited by the freedom of other people. But Rothbard doesn't want to talk on those terms, and I don't think Roderick Long would either, and want to say that it's not your freedom that's limited, it's only your, your power that's limited. Anyway, so what is the nature of this obligation? I want to, I want to look at it now not from the part of the, on the part of the person with the right, but the, uh, but, but, but the uh, one else's uh, obligation, which of course the person with the right also has. He has an obligation regarding other people. What's the nature of this obligation? This is a very important question, it seems to me. Libertarians talk a lot about the aggression uh, principle. It's mostly called that these days. But um, I, I very rarely hear, uh, it's taken for granted, I rarely hear it answered, why, why does this principle bind anybody? Why does it? It seems like a pretty good question to me that non-libertarians may ask, and we ought to have an answer. Uh, the first thing to notice is, is that it's an, un it's, unchosen. it's an unchosen obligation. I never agreed not to aggress against anyone. When I was growing up, nobody gave me an agreement to sign. And others never agreed to aggress, not to aggress against me. So if I were to strike someone and this person would object and said, and, and I said, uh, I never agreed to strike you to that person, chances are that person is not, not going to accept that as a, as a defense. Uh, now, even in an explicit agreement rests on an unchosen obligation. So let's say you lend me $5, and I refuse to repay the loan. And when you demand repayment, I say, why am I obligated to repay the money? And you would probably say, because you agreed to repay me. Uh, but if I replied, true, but when did I agree to abide by my agreements? What would you say? If you said that failure to repay constituted aggression, and I replied that I never agreed not to aggress against you, well, we're back where we started. You know, where'd that come from? And this, of course, would lead the way to absurdity, an infinite regress of agreements to keep my agreements. Uh, it would get us nowhere. There's got to be a starting point. So if, if I were to ask, if, if, if I were to ask uh, why do we owe it to others not to aggress against them, what do you think you'd say? I presume some answer would be rooted, I mean, the, the answers, even though they may differ, would be rooted in, in a, a set of facts. Uh, because the alternative would be to say that this principle has no basis whatsoever, no justification. That it's just a free-floating free principle, like an iceberg. But that would amount to saying that uh, the principle has no binding force. I mean, it's just a whim, which uh, might not be shared by other people. Why, why should people uh, abide by it? In other words, if a non-libertarian demands to know why he is bound by the unchosen uh, NAP, uh, libertarians will have answers. The answers will differ. Some will be more robust than others, but they will have answers. At least I hope so. Now, if we have an unchosen obligation not to aggress against others, and that obligation is rooted in certain facts, as I presume, this raises a new question. Might the facts that impose the unchosen obligation not to aggress also impose other obligations? If one unchosen obligation can be shown to exist, why couldn't the same foundation in which that one is rooted produce others? I think that's an interesting question. So to the question, why do we owe it to others not to aggress against them, I would respond along these lines. Because we individually should treat other persons respectfully, that is, as ends in themselves and not merely as means to our own ends. Uh, this is You see this formulation in Kant, but it actually goes uh, back to earlier, uh, earlier thinkers, uh, uh, not a lock has a, a, a says something very similar. He says people are not for our our use. Other people are not for our use. But some libertarians would reject that as too broad because it seems to obligate obligate us to more than just non-aggression. They might answer the question this way: to the question I've asked about why do you why do we owe it to others not to aggress? Because one may use force against another only in defense or retaliation against someone who initiated the use of force. But this can't be uh, a sufficient 
reply because it amounts to a circular argument. To say that one may use force only in response to aggression is in effect merely to restate the non-aggression principle. One shouldn't aggress because one shouldn't aggress. But the NAP can hardly justify itself. By the way, I was attacked uh, by a guy, I think at Huffington Post, uh, I think it was Ray Salon, by uh, a guy by the name of Matt Brunig who made this very argument. He said that libertarians argued in a circular way, that they define property in terms of aggression, but they, they, they define the aggression in terms of property. I, I, I attempted to answer him. I did think I refuted him by showing that it's not a, we don't make a circular argument, that, we, that uh, property is, is validated first, and then aggression is defined in terms of property, and, including property of oneself, of course. So we need a real justification for the non-aggression obligation, and the one I've offered seems like a good start. The, uh, the, the obligation is an, is, is, is an implication of the more general obligation to treat persons respectfully. By that I mean as ends and not merely as means. Of course, this also requires justification. Why should we treat other people, other persons, respectfully? Many libertarians, though certainly not all, approach the question of just conduct, specifically as it relates to the use of force, from egoistic considerations, such as those provided by Ayn Rand. I mean, this is, I think, evidence of one of, uh, of Ayn Rand's uh, huge influence on the libertarian movement, at least uh, uh, my generation of libertarians, maybe less so in the, in the generations that have followed so these, these uh, more egoistic libertarians would say that we should never aggress against others because doing so would be contrary to our own self-interest. Uh, for example, that dishonesty required by a life of injustice would be psychologically damaging, and we'd eventually run out of victims. This is, uh, Rand made this argument, and Leonard Peikoff uh, has made this argument. Uh, but Socrates and Plato saw a problem with uh, the first part of this sort of answer. I mean, they, Socrates and Plato... Uh, anticipated these uh, these issues uh, many years ago, 2,500 years ago or so. If one could act unjustly toward others while appearing to be just, could unjust conduct serve one's self-interest? In other words, uh, if your reputation would be maintained, which means people would still continue to deal with you, yet you're getting away with injustice, why not do it? Egoistic libertarians can be asked the same question. What if you could lead an unjust life with a guarantee of the appearance of justice? Uh, must dishonesty be damaging? Now, the same people who would say yes to that question, I mean, Randy in particular, would also say that a person who spins, let's say, a complicated web of lies to keep the Nazis from learning that he's harboring uh, Jews in his attic won't suffer such damage. If that person can escape harm, though, why not uh, the unjust liar? Saying that one set of lies is for a good cause uh, doesn't strike me as an adequate answer. How would a good cause save someone from the harm of uh, faking reality? So in other words, if simply weaving a complicated set of lies to keep a secret is damaging when it's in, in the cause of injustice, why wouldn't it also be da damaging if it's the, in the cause of justice? So, uh, since I'm, I'm assuming here, and I think everyone will agree with me, it's perfectly okay to lie to the Nazis uh, that you're hiding Jews in your attic. Uh, so it seems that a simple self-interest model doesn't take us where we want to go, to the unchosen obligation to respect other people's freedom, or more broadly, treat persons as ends, not merely as means. I would be a little uneasy if a libertarian told me that it is only his self-interest that prevents him from clubbing me on the head and making off with my wallet. Because how do I know tomorrow he won't see his self-interest a little differently? And yet self-interest might still provide an answer. I'm not ready to throw it out. Roderick Long atta uh, tackles this uh, problem, I think, very nicely in his extended essay, uh, Reason and Value, Aristotle versus Rand. You can find this at Amazon, but uh, there's also a PDF of it online if you just search on the name uh, Reason and Value, Aristotle versus Rand by Roderick Long. But what Long shows, to my satisfaction at least, is that Rand's notion of uh, self-interest, as expressed in her non-fiction essays, is too flimsy to support the libertarian prohibition on aggression, and the general injunction to treat people respectfully. To be more precise, Long shows that Rand's explicit writings on ethics, that means her nonfiction, uh, are a tangle of at least three different and inconsistent defenses for the non-aggression uh, obligation. One of the three, which I won't discuss tonight, is Kantian. So there, there's something for I irony, since uh, Rand was not terribly fond of Immanuel Kant. But before we get into this, I must invoke an important distinction that Long emphasizes. It's really a key to the whole thing here. 
uh, namely the distinction between instrumental and co constitutive means. An instrumental means is, an ex is external to an end. A constitutive means is intrinsic to the end. We can't imagine the end without it. So uh, let me use an example that Long uses of a man dressing up for an evening out. Here, dressing, out, dressing up includes uh, wearing a necktie. So the difference between an uh, instrumental means and a, and, a, and a constitutive means. Shopping for a tie is an instrumental means. Wearing the tie is a constitutive means. It's part of what we mean by dressing up, at least in this cultural uh, uh, environment of the hypothetical. One can dress up without shopping for a tie, but one cannot dress up without wearing a tie. So I want to really make clear this distinction now between an instrumental ends, which is more like a bridge to the end, and a constitutive, uh, sorry, means, constitutive, uh, instrumental means, which is the bridge to the end, and a constitutive means, which is inherent in the end itself and can't really be separated. So we can look at justice, which includes respect for other people's rights, uh, in both ways, instrumental and constitutive. Uh, does respect for uh, people's rights instrumentally serve our self-interest merely because we would earn good reputations and others will uh, cooperate with us? Uh, this, by the way, was uh, Hobbes' position. Hobbes, Hobbes thought it was, uh, you know, it was wise not to aggress against people because you would have a good reputation and people would deal with you. And, uh, and you see some of this in Rand. Or is respecting people's rights also a a constituent of living a good uh, life of uh, flourishing. This is more Greek, a Greek conception than Aristotelian or Socratic conception. So respecting other people's rights would be an inherent part of living the human life, a good human life of flourishing. So the answer here is crucial. In the first case, one's self-interest could be served by acting unjustly so long as one could appear to be just. Uh, you know, uh, Plato and Aristotle talk about the case where somebody has this magic ring and makes him invisible, uh, who then, might, you know, the question is, should he then go around stealing from people because he's not going to get caught? Uh, in the second case, one could not flourish by acting unjustly, even if one could go undetected. As Aristotle suggested, it is preferable to live justly, although with a reputation for injustice, than it is to live unjustly with a reputation for justice. Uh, uh, Socrates also said it was better to be a victim uh, of, of injustice than it, rather than a perpetrator of it. So Long shows that Rand has both instrumental and constitutive elements in her nonfiction writing on ethics. In some places she says a person's goal should be uh, apparently sheer survival, while in other places she, she speaks of survival qua man, as, as man, as a rational being. Uh, it isn't entirely clear whether individuals should aim at the longest possible life regardless of the type of life or at a particular type of life regardless of its length. Her novels appear to take the, this latter position. Suicide is even contemplated by heroic characters in uh, Atlas Shrugged. Um, if it's the first instrumental, then violating someone's rights might occasionally be to one's self-interest. Imagine that at 4 a.m. you pass an alley in a deserted part of town where a man is passed out and a hundred dollar bill sticking out of his pocket. Chan chances of getting caught are zero or pretty close. Do you take the money? If not, why not? An instrumental model of justice should say take the money or at least maybe take the money or at least consider taking the money. A constitutive model would not. Now it might be said that a rational person acts on rational principles and uh, doesn't judge things on a case-by-case -case basis. This is Peacock's answer. Uh, even if in particular cases his or, self, his or her self-interest is not served. In other words, it's important to act on principles which tend to serve your self-interest, but you don't judge every individual instance on its own. You, you apply the principle. But Long points out that this, this uh, what, what, what we could be, would call rule egoism ends up being uh, not egoism at all since the rule is followed regardless of the consequences. Uh, and this makes this approach deontolog uh, deontological, that is rule-oriented, duty-oriented, rather than teleological, which is end-oriented, as Rand would want it. So this reply uh, seems inadequate. The rule egoist reply seems inadequate. Because either, I mean, it's an unstable, it's an unstable rule, because either 
the rule is going to be followed even when it's not in your self-interest, in which case you're not an egoist, you're a rule follower, or you're going to uh, give up the rule in cases where it's not in your self-interest, in which case you're not a rule egoist at all, you're back to being a regular egoist or what's, what might be called an act egoist. So what are the grounds for accepting the constitutive model of virtue, which is the one I'm, I'm uh, clearly favoring here, uh, including uh, uh, the model of virtue, including justice? Uh, turning to Aristotle, Long uh, says the following, and uh, you'll, you'll forgive a rather extended quote, but I think it's worthwhile here. And in, in this quote, he's going to use two, uh, two of Aristotle's terms, Greek terms, uh, logicon, you can see the word logic in it, uh, and uh, politicon, and there you can see the word political in it. Logicon, uh, Aristotle, by that Aristotle meant a, uh, a language-using, discursive, uh, reasoning being. And politicon, while it sounds like political, but he talked about human beings being both political and social animals. And uh, the quote will have something to say about that, but I wanted to introduce those terms. So Long writes, for Aristotle, a human being is essentially a logicon animal and a politicon animal. To be a rational animal is to be a language-using animal, a conversing animal, a discursive animal, and to live a human life is thus to live a life centered around discourse. Our nature as logicon is thus uh, closely allied with our nature as politicon. To be a politicon animal is not simply to be an animal that lives in groups or sets up governments. It is to cooperate with others on the basis of discourse about shared ends. Being politicon for Aristotle is an expression of being uh, logicon. Uh, just as logicon animals naturally conduct their private affairs through reason rather than through unreflective passion, so they naturally conduct their common affairs through public discourse and rational persuasion rather than through violence, close quote. So thus, uh, Long adds, quote, to violate the rights of others then is to lessen one's humanity. To trample on the rights of others is never in our self-interest because well-being cannot, and here he quotes Aristotle, come about for those who rob and use force, close quote. So one's goal is to flourish by achieving excellence in those things that make us human. Aristotle says that, quote, the task of man is a certain life, and, and, th and this an activity and actions of soul with logos, logos related to that word logicon, which refers in Aristotle to reason and language and, and related uh, ideas. So one cannot flourish if one lives in a non-human way. If this sounds like it, it's because her fictional characters understood, understand it. Uh, even her non-fiction uh, essays do not express it unambiguously. So Long concludes, a truly human life then will be, be a life characterized by reason and intelligent cooperation. And here uh, we had a reference to animals before. Bees may cooperate after a fashion, but not on the basis of discourse about shared ends. To a logicon animal, reason has value not only as an instrumental means to other goals, but as an intrinsic and constitutive part of a fully human life. And the same holds true for cooperation. The logicon animal, insofar as it generally expresses logos, will not, deal, will not deal in cooperative terms with others merely because doing so makes others more likely to contribute instrumentally to the agent's good. Rather, the agent will see a life of cooperation with others as an essential part of his own good. Now, if this is right, we owe respect to others' humanity via respect for their rights because the activity manifesting that respect is a constituent of one's own flourishing as a logicon, as logicon and politicon animals. We owe it, in other words, we owe it to ourselves to owe it to others who are also logicon and politicon animals, since objectively they are ends and not merely means. Uh, so this, this obligation to others begins as an obligation to ourselves, but then takes on sort of a, uh, a freestanding obligation to other people because of what they are but it is still ultimately traceable back to what it takes for, for each of us to flourish. Uh, this Aristotelian insight points to an interpersonal moral realm in which the basic interests of others meld in important ways with our own. Uh, as Long says, to the extent that we are logic on animals, participation in a human community, together with a shared pursuit of the human good, is a constitutive part of a truly human life. But does this show that we owe anything more than non-aggression? Uh, and it seems to. 
We abstain from aggressing against others because, as Logicon and Politicon animals, we flourish by engaging the humanity of other individuals. Clearly, abstaining from aggression is not the only way to engage their humanity, just as aggression is not the only way to, den to deny their humanity. Thus, these Aristotelian considerations entail the obligation to treat others respectfully, broadly. So one last question remains. Uh, is this obligation broadly to treat other persons as ends and not merely as means a libertarian matter? I mean, some people have argued that it is not, that it's, it may be of uh, interest to us as, into, as just as decent human beings, but not as libertarians. <clears throat> I think it is, does matter to us as libertarians, at least in this way. The obligation broadly to treat other persons as ends and not merely as means is validated by the same set of facts that validate the non-aggression principle or obligation. Non-aggression is simply one application of respect. Thus, thus, a libertarian society in which people generally thought that non-aggression was all they owed others would be a society that should fear for its future viability qua libertarian society. Finally, I'm sure libertarians do not have to be reminded that non-aggressive affronts against persons, in other words, lack of uh, show, uh, acts of, of disrespect, may be responded to only in non-aggressive ways. Neither government nor private force may, de may be deployed to counter peaceful offenses. Why not? Because the rule of proportionality dictates that force may be used only to meet force. In other words, some obligations are enforceable and others are not. Values other than non-aggression uh, cannot trump non-aggression, the value of non-aggression. Okay, I hope that will be enough to uh, launch a uh, discussion here. Let me unmute all microphones. And it uh, looks like I took up about half the time, so that leaves about half an hour for uh, conversation, discussion. So who wants to, uh, who would like to begin? I'll jump in, Sheldon. Go ahead. Um, if I understood you, part of the problem that you referred to uh, was that these arguments for the non-aggression principle and other things that libertarians value become circular. Uh, but then you also said at the beginning of your discussion that uh, you know, we bump up against this desire for precision and we shouldn't be too demanding of the desire for precision. So I would interpret what you say, I would interpret what you say as consistent with what Stefan Molyneux calls universally preferable behavior. If we look around and we see what people generally believe and want in their lives, that is, you know, not to be aggressed against and not to aggress others. And obviously there's aberrations from that over society that, you know, we have uh, Nazis and we have people that work in government now that don't seem to abide by that principle at all. But otherwise, generally, generally people uh, abide by what he refers to as universally preferable behavior. And then if you start saying, well, what is universally preferable? Well, that's the same question that to you is, well, what does it mean to, rec to uh, recognize somebody? At some point, you just have to stop the definitions and say, look, we all under, excuse me, not to recognize, you said respect. At some point, we have to stop the, uh, the regressive definition and say, look, everybody knows what it means to respect somebody. Everybody kind of understands what universal pre universally pre preferable behavior is. I mean, we can, we can argue on the fringes of those ideas about what they are and maybe get some more precision. But at some point, we have to say, look, we all understand this. This makes sense. This is why the non-aggression principle is at the heart of what a libertarian is. And this is why we believe everybody in society should embrace it more completely than they do. Uh, I, I uh, don't have any real problem with that. Uh, the only thing I'd say is it seems to be confined to the, to the level of intuition. And I think people do generally have libertarian intuitions. Uh, they don't understand that they should also apply them to government. But like I've said before, most you know most people don't think that it would be proper for them to rob or assault or you know do any of those kinds of common law offenses uh, against others. They think it would be wrong. What what I'm hoping I'm doing here, and whether and I don't claim that this is original stuff. I mean, I obviously I drew a lot on Roderick Long, and and you can find a lot of this in Rothbard in the Ethics of Liberty. I think where he discusses natural law. I think we've given a theoretical foundation. To it now, maybe not everybody requires you know that a, a, a theoretical foundation uh, that, that the level of intuition is okay with them, but that seems to me there will be people that might demand more because they may not fully you know hold that intuition and, and want to know why they ought to. So 
I, I don't have any problem with anything you said. Uh, well, it's just that there may be cases where we want to, yeah, go further and, and give more of a foundation. Well, right. The only thing I would say in response to that is maybe I maybe I don't understand all of the theoretical points that you made. Uh, there, was a lot of meat. there was a lot of meat in there, and I'll have to digest it uh, for a period of time to fully understand it. But uh, yeah, I think that's great. Let's not simply rely on intuition. But I guess. You know, to the extent I understand what you say, I hearken back to what you began the whole talk with: is that we can only we we can we can um, um, try to get to a certain level of precision, and I think that's what you did. But even even then, we're limited in the precision that we can have about such things as what it means to respect somebody, for example. No, no, I think that's true. I I, I agree with you, and I, and I think Aristotle is absolutely right about that. I mean, you know, some some types, some people who who sometimes come from a Misesian background, where in economics you can have, uh, uh, under praxeology and the, you know the Austrian conception, you can have these slam dunk arguments, right, which are apodictically certain because they're they're uh, you're drawing out the implications of something we know for sure, namely that human beings act, uh, and then they transplant that and want to see find that in the area of ethics or political ethics, mm. and so that's why I started with that Aristotelian point that you can't expect the same kind of precision in uh, one area like uh, geometry or praxeology uh, as, 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 we're like, as we're able to find in something like ethics or, or political theory. So, I agree, no, I agree with you. Yeah, if, if you get yeah. too tight, even universally preferential behavior gets dicey when you bring in the context of sociopathy and so forth because there's no bargaining with those people. The only bargain with those people apparently is force. Right, right. Well, fortunately, that's a uh, you know a minority. <laughs> yeah, but but I mean the point being that you've got to be careful with the precision, even in that regard, because it's not universal to them. <laughs> right, and it doesn't mean that any one of those types that you have in mind could ever be convinced by anything we say. So the test well, is: yeah. will everybody be persuaded by this? That that can't be the test. You might be able to convince them that it's safer to accept other people's norms, which I think they probably try to appear to do. But they would go for so, the idea, so you know, that the, the, they would take up the Socratic challenge and say, yes, if I could, it's better that I can be as unjust as I, as I want to be while appearing to be perfectly just, because that way I don't sure. get caught and people are leaving me alone. But meanwhile, I'm making out like a bandit. <laughs> that, that sure reminded me of the state, the idea of appearing to be just and, <laughs> and not being anywhere close to it. That's why Spooner said the highwayman was was much more honest right. than the state. <laughs> yes, and uh, yes, I, I I don't think you can top Spooner. He's, on, he's right about that. <laughs> Anybody else want to? Uh... One thing it... one thing I was going to going to mention was uh, as the the non-aggression principle. I mean, the one thing the beauty of it that gives gives it most of its power, without expanding it out to other matters of respect and that is the fact that it really is a least common denominator sort of thing. I mean, I think St. Augustine wrote the same thing in City of God, where you had, the, you had the, the good guys and the bad guys all living together, and there's only one thing in this world that we can ever get them to agree on, and that everyone values peace. And uh, as soon as you start trying to expand the scope of um, common values, you start getting uh, significant numbers of dissenters from the view, and the whole thing falls apart. And this thick and thin libertarian thing, it seems to me the exact same danger is there, yeah. that the maximum number of people can agree on the non-aggression principle, and they start falling away the moment you begin to move away from that. Because it tends to, to, to be far away from the fuzzy areas on each side. It's yeah. right smack in the middle of that, instead of... Um, bordering on either one. Yeah, I think so too. Well, the uh, you know the, this the idea behind uh, what's being called thick libertarianism, which may not be the most attractive term. I think rich libertarianism is <laughs> sound better. <laughs> someone someone wrote an article called "Thick as a Brick," which is an argument against uh, thick libertarianism. Uh, but uh, it's not so. It's, it, it doesn't say there has to be universal agreement on other values besides non-aggression in order to be a libertarian. A person can be perfectly libertarian uh, as long as he accepts the non, you know the non-aggression principle, obligation, axiom, maxim, whatever you want, whatever you want to call it, all of the above. 
uh, it just it just says that uh, other values are affiliated with libertarian either through the foundation that you get to your libertarianism uh, from or uh, strategic considerations for um, uh, bringing about a libertarian society or you know or, or various other things it just says that these uh, these these other values like tolerance for example uh, are affiliated with libertarianism but it doesn't say you you can't be a libertarian if you don't hold them it just says it it, it it might, in a given society, if this intolerance, let's say, got to a certain level, it might become something of concern for libertarians who feared for the future of that libertarian society. Uh, so that's, that's the argument. It's not that there, here's a whole set of values you have to subscribe to in order to be a libertarian. I mean, Rand was, was a thick libertarian in that sense, right? She, she thought you needed to not like Mozart but, and needed to love uh, Rachmaninoff to be uh, a full, she wouldn't use the word libertarian, she didn't like the word. To be a full objectivist, which included respecting other people's rights, she, she'd say you have to, uh, you know, hate Mozart and love Rachmaninoff. I mean, she had a full list, a long list of values that you needed to subscribe to. That was a form of thick libertarianism. So thick libertarianism doesn't even uh, tell you specifically what values you think are affiliated. There can be a lot of disagreement about that. It just means you think there are other values, there were values other than non-aggression, which are affiliated with, uh, with libertarianism. Anyway, just wanted to be clear on that. Do you suppose that if um, you know we ever got to a this free society, that the different positions that people would have, whether it be left or right, that you would see it communities developing that tended toward one area or another? I mean, I, I mean, to me, it's not that attractive. I think I just soon live in, you know, kind of potluck. Yeah, but, I agree with you. Well, I think you see some of that. Um, some people. I think the term like that, that was invented. Yep. Yeah. Good. I'm sorry. I think the term that was invented at one point was uh, proprietary communities. Yeah. The idea yeah. that people would voluntarily associate, perhaps even on other people's property, agreeing to the terms of the property owner, mm -hmm. and in that way, um, there would be someone whose <clears throat> rules, if you accept them, you except to be in that society, otherwise you leave it. Um, I yeah. think that's, I think, uh, well, who was it that said that you can have socialism within libertarianism, but you can't have libertarianism within socialism? Yeah. I think that's an expression sure. of that. No, I think, I think you're going to see quite a variety, a broad variety of, uh, of ways of living and also preferences along the lines that you're asking about. Uh, I know my own taste. I think it, uh, Randall, I will side with you. I mean, I'm a, I, I'm a cosmo, I'm a cosmopolitan. I mean, I like a variety where there's a variety, a variety of restaurants of all kinds of you know ethnic food and and cultures and things like that. I would want to be, hopefully, situated where I'd be close to that. Other people, I guess, for whatever reason, uh, will want to be in a more homogeneous community. And you know, obviously, people ought to be free to make those choices. Uh, yeah, but even if you yeah. belong, only belong to a town that just has people in your own church, it can get a little obnoxious. Yeah, well, uh, I'm with you. I'd want the variety, but but I I, uh, I recognize that some people uh, won't. Maybe they're more comfortable in in being in a place where there's very little variety, a very homogeneous place. And I mean, wonder yeah, if they ought to be free to go their own way. Of course, I mean that's that's what it means to be a libertarian. I wonder if it might not be in the nature of people who self-identify as libertarian to be more cosmopolitan and not, what would you call it, rule-oriented, uh, uh, leaning toward coercive, whatever that is. I don't really want to get too deep into that, but the idea that a lot more laissez-faire, I guess. Right. Well, in general. Well, the op I, by the opposite, the opposite of cosmopolitanism that I had in mind was not somebody that would you know use aggression. I mean, it's just a peaceful parochial type of person sure. who'd rather yeah. be around, you know, quote his own type. Uh, yeah. The, the reason why it it came to me was because I had a discussion with my uncle, who's a bit of a fellow traveler, and he likes to flatter me and tell me how much he learns from me and so forth. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, simply because I've spent so much time thinking about liberty. But um, we got to thinking about the potentially corrosive effects of voluntary collectives because they often 
and you feel this from I feel this from some other libertarians the 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 anxiety they feel from the potentiality of being subtly coerced into living a certain lifestyle without any real overt coercion Did that was that yeah. well stated and so that's one of the reasons why a lot of them tend to tend to not like organized religion and that kind of thing and not to take a side on it, but just to expose the view, I think. You know, I think there can be uh, oppression of a sort that doesn't involve force. And so I'm, 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 I'm cer I certainly think there can be such a thing that doesn't have to be sustained by force. And if, if, uh, if a liber I, it seems to me, if I were to see that right, if I, we were living in a libertarian society, and I, and I got the sense that that sort of oppressiveness was rising, uh, although it didn't involve physical force, uh, I think at least I'd be, I might notice it and have some concern about it and, you know, yeah. see where it was going uh, bec because I might feel that the, the libertarian nature of, the, of our, of that society might not be able to be sustained. I mean, there are, there are certain attitudes that underpin a libertarian society. I think, I think that's, a, uh, it seems to be indisputable and, and it's not only force that would threaten a libertarian society. It could be a turn in attitude that 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 led to sort of widespread open disrespect for persons, and that would be of concern to me as a, as a libertarian, not just as a decent person. I mean, I have look, I have rigor, vigorous arguments with with people on this who say, no, that shouldn't concern you as a libertarian as long as there's no force. But I don't buy the idea that it nothing short nothing short of force would ever cause me concern as a libertarian. I, that seems dogmatic to insist that nothing short of force. I, I think concern. Alexis de Tocqueville. Um, uh, talked a little bit about that, that it didn't have to be just democracy that was corrosive, but the opinions of the people at large that could, well, yeah, I mean, look at subtle things like, um, oh, what's the correct terminology for it? Um, the way homosexuals are treated in general, not codified in any way, but just yeah. the way they're treated. Um, the term bullying is getting a lot of uh, Mm -hmm. is getting a lot of um, play these days. And I, I guess it's, it's possibly a response to that reality that causes people who are more statist in nature to want to write laws to stop people from behaving that way. Yeah. No, well, we, I think as libertarians we need to uh, point out that just because there's a problem, this, that doesn't mean the state is the solution. So when I'm, I'm now talking about problems that don't involve force, uh, right. There are non-state things that people can do. I mean, you can boycott a place that you where you don't like the policies of the owner. You know, if the owner, let's say, is known to uh, keep certain people out, members of ethnic racial groups. You know, I don't mean people who, uh, you know, are shoeless. You know, you have stores that say no shirt, no shoes, no service. That's one thing. But if they keep out members of, uh, you know, an ethnic group or a religious group. Uh, there, it may be justified to say, well, I don't care to, uh, my, me, my friends and I don't, won't, don't patronize that place. We don't like that, uh, that sort of policy, and so we stay away from the place. Uh, that's, that's, of course, that's market activity too, right? That's libertarian activity. It's not coercive. You're not smashing his windows. You're just making your right. displeasure known. Someone indicated that the, the solution to bad expression was more expression about how bad that bad expression is. And, yep. and I kind of like that myself. Yep. Right. Say, uh, can, can, I, can I raise a technical question real quick? Sure. Does anybody else, the biggest thing on your screen is uh, Sheldon's browser? Yeah. Oh, are you, are you seeing <laughs> yes. it? And the Facebook page. Do you see it now? We're seeing something that appears to be in the freezer oh, section. <laughs> do, you see it, do you see it now? That's better. No, it's, it's gone. gone. Uh, oh. I, have a, <laughs> I have a less tactical question, Sheldon, if I may. Uh, <laughs> I hope you weren't reading my uh, feed on uh, new, on Facebook. <laughs> I, I, I got a screenshot of it. <laughs> it's right there. <laughs> Sheldon, yeah. Sheldon, you you and you individually, I suppose, and you and Hornberger go around the nation and you you talk about libertarian ideas. You've devoted your life to it. You know, everybody on this call is interested in mm -hmm. libertarian ideas and spreading liber liberty. Right. I want to ask. I, I want to ask you to comment on what you have, have uh, observed. Nowadays, it seems to me that you have a swelling, a growth of people who embrace these libertarian ideas, but you also have a growth of people that like 
the leftist, you know, the agenda of Obama, for example. Do you see that? Do you see both things happening concurrently? Uh, and if so, what do you see the outcome? Is one going to win out? Or are they both just going to be people that, you know, reside in the camp that, that want more laws and more control over our lives? I, and I see young people that are, you know, just unbelievably enamored with Obama. And it's like, it, it's, it's disgusting. I teach at a college and I see people that and it, it's like, you don't even know where to begin to talk to them. Well. You know, I, I, I am not on a campus uh, that often, so and the people we see when we go out are, are basically libertarians, so I'm not, it's hardly a cross-section. Uh, I was hoping that the disillusionment had long ago set in with Obama, among at least the younger set. Is that not the case? Uh, no? I don't think so. I, I mean, thought I, maybe I, I it's just possible. Still. I, I think to some extent the left seem to express, when they do express dissatisfaction with Obama, Mm -hmm. I think the way they frame it is that he's not he's uh, not forceful enough in in the leftist ideals mm -hmm. and that he's been co-opted by the system and and that's the way they they don't see it as being the system mm -hmm. I mean that's the whole point right that, that that's the nature of the system um, absolute power corrupts. You know, you, you get the point. The uh, Lord Axe film. Yeah. For, well, for me, Sheldon. Yeah. Go ahead. Go for ahead. me, Sheldon. The, the evidence. I teach at a campus. The evidence of the um, acquiescence, at the very least, of Obama's policies is the deafening silence. All of this stuff going on about all these people care so much about everybody having insurance and health care and the fiasco that's exploded, and nobody in the whole ways that I talk to, except one person who's in the business, ever mentions anything about their disgust. Even if they like government approach, they never mention anything about what has happened and the results. They never, they don't, it's, the silence is deafening. They just accept it. Mm. Well, there are scientific studies that have been done on um, persuasion, or how should I put it, on debate, where one side gives gives their point of view and another side gives their point of view and when the mind they've, they've done functional MRIs of the brain and when the mind encounters this this thing that would generally cause what we'd call cognitive dissonance mm -hmm. basically the mind shuts down and so it's not something that this is the thing a challenge for libertarians I believe that it's not something that they do. It's something that the human mind does. That it screens out things that are outside of its normal range of experience and beliefs. Yeah. And so it takes some kind of novel approach to penetrate that wall. No, I agree. I agree. Um, there's confirmation bias. There's a, there's a whole bunch of things. Where people like their comfort zone and they don't go out to find evidence to subvert their worldview. Most people don't do that. It's unpleasant. Uh, yeah. Brian Kaplan talks about and that. And we have to strive, point. and because that's a, that's, a, that's a fault with us as much as anybody, we have to recognize that and try to get around that ourselves, and that's really difficult. Yeah, it's, just, it's a human thing, and you're right, but it means we have to look for ways to communicate with people that will, number one, seem less threatening to them so that they, maybe the defenses will go down a little bit. I always think of this sort of the force field, uh, you know, in Star Trek or something. You've got to get them to lower that, that defensive shield. Uh, and, and, and ourselves, yeah. to challenge our own yeah. biases. No, agreed. Very difficult. Absolutely. We have to understand why people resist our ideas, even though they practice them in their own lives. But they, why aren't they more open to the idea that, okay, apply the same moral rules to, to the politicians as you apply to yourself and your neighbors? That, that's a nice breaker I often use. I, I point out that, well, being libertarian is basically how you normally live your yeah. life when you're not thinking about what the government's going to do to you if you don't do it their mm -hmm. way. I agree. You know, well, we, are speaking, yeah. we are speaking about education. So uh, it depends on education of people. The viewpoint and of people, and I completely agree with uh, Peter mm -hmm. um, because, uh, well, I taught some uh, 
some years in, the, um, in college. Uh, not in America, not uh, while I'm from Canada, not, uh, not in America, not in Canada, but uh, rather in Israel. And, um, well, um, obviously, the, some, some people um, can uh, see the, um, the thing of uh, expression, how do you express your mind and, uh, as an aggression. Uh, and uh, well, a lot of people see an expression of your mind and uh, we think as an aggression. And, um, some people ask me a question, what does aggression mean? So, um, I'm pretty new in uh, the libertarian uh, philosophy for, for this, uh, um, circle, in this circle, but um, we always speak about aggression uh, more, and uh, I just understood uh, here in uh, North America uh, a lot of people just uh, mixed in competition with aggression. Mm. You see? Just like that, and the old question of education. So you're saying they uh, that when they think of competition, they think of aggression in the same thought. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So uh, maybe I am kind of uh, outstander in the just kind of uh, ten years in North America, but I I can tell you that uh, um, the people um, uh, from the um, let's say left camp, so they see. Um, um, the uh, competition is an aggression, and um, from the right hand you can see uh, not aggression at all, just self-defense or uh, defense of some, some values, some such as, uh, for example, the uh, Canadian government for uh, all this Ukrainian stuff, you know, um, so it's not libertarian at all, <laughs> as I see. I try to point out to people who who conf confuse aggression with comp with competition. That I try to point out that competition is really just the opposite side of the coin from cooperation. Because if you're free to choose who you'll cooperate with, that the byproduct of that is competition, right? If I go into a shopping mall and there are two shoe stores and I need shoes, each of those shoe stores wants to cooperate with me, right? In my quest for shoes, but that means they're, they're competing with each other, but that's a byproduct of the, each of them wanting to compete with me, and my freedom to choose who I'll co uh, cooperate with. So th they go together. Cooperation and, and is not aggression. I mean, co competition is not aggression. It's, it's actually part of cooperation. Mm -hmm. That's how I try to explain it. Okay, thanks. Where do you teach? Uh, is it Damir? Am I saying your name right? Yes, my name is Damir, and um, I taught, uh, well, I don't teach uh, right now, but uh, I taught um, in Israel uh, uh, life science, and um, actually uh, all, uh, a lot of uh, epidemiology and um, ecology and all Kropotkin stuff ah. we used to speak about <laughs> just at the beginning of our discussions. So. Yeah, was that uh, university, le university level? Uh, it's university level. Yes, okay. And where where are you where are you now right now are you far you you in the U S uh, no I'm not in the U S I'm in Canada Canada okay Canada. okay is it possible that they see their their connection between competition and aggression as being formed by their tendency to view of a fixed pie where if you have a piece of it, that means somebody else doesn't have that piece? Yeah, I think so. I think that's true for a lot of mm -hmm. yeah, a lot of people. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. Sheldon, did you hear, and uh, are others here listening, uh, I think Krauheimer said this. I heard on the radio, I'm not sure if it's true, that there was a 100,000 uh, uh, petitioners to the Washington Post, the Washington Times, saying that no one who questions global warming should be allowed to write a piece in that paper. There's like a hundred thousand signatures saying that they should. That's really scary when people are saying, "Did you hear that?" I didn't hear about that particular. I haven't heard about that, but I've I've heard you know something similar that the people saying that the the debate is over and they shouldn't be put on you know news programs. Uh, people who who uh, are skeptical. About I guess I would retaliate by questioning their right to say that. <laughs> well, they have a right to say it. They just don't. Have well, a right well to... the, you you understand it's a rhetorical statement, right? Right. right. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a different subject altogether, of course, but that is infuriating when they when people want to say when 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 people say the debate's over, no more debate. That makes me especially right. skeptical. Because what are you afraid of? Agreed. <laughs> but that's a different subject. Anything else in the in the remaining minutes here? I see we've got two minutes to go on uh, on this topic. Anybody else want to get a what's, last what's word? What's your next What's your next topic? Uh. I don't know if we selected it yet, so I need to look at my schedule. Um, but watch, watch the uh, the FFF site. It'll be the you know that that Wednesday the with the first uh, the first Wednesday that has the double digit in the uh, in the date. That's how we we know what what week it is. Uh, there'll be an announcement at the site. Yeah, I don't I don't know if we picked it yet or I just not not remembering it. So anybody uh, final remarks by anybody? Final farewell. Appreciate uh, you all being here. Thank you, Sheldon. Thank you, Sheldon. Thank you. Thank you. Good. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.